All right, it's about halfway there. Almost there. And for those of you who are just coming in, um, all right, and we are officially live on YouTube. Um, so those of you who are just coming in, our new participants, um, please um, drop your name in the chat maybe a little bit about who you are, your zip code if possible. We'd love to keep track of who we're reaching. And um, if you have any questions throughout, throw those in the chat too. And we, we would just love to keep in touch with you. I'm gonna drop the YouTube link in here too, in case you wanna share it with your friends and family who aren't on Zoom right now. So um, Meredith, I'll hand it over to you. All right, let me see if I can get my screen up for sharing. Uh, and first of all, thank you everyone uh, for showing up. There's so many of you here and it's, it's such a privilege to spend um, this time, especially, you know, given that it's Earth Day, just hanging out with people, you know, like our vir virtual online community together, um, just doing, doing a little bit of good for research and conservation. Um, so hopefully this will just be like a very low key fun introduction to citizen science. We'll do some citizen science together. Um, so I just quickly wanted to introduce everyone who's uh, on the panel and who's helped make this possible. My name is Meredith. Um, I'm a biologist. I work at Princeton University. Um, my field is ecology. So I run a number of long-term wildlife monitoring projects all across Africa and I'm involved in some monitoring in the United States as well. And those projects are really only made possible by the help of citizen scientists. So I rely a ton on volunteers, just like you, to get my research done. Um, and then we also have Megan. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Testerman. I'm the psychology and neuroscience librarian at Princeton University. I'm joining you from sunny New Jersey. And I want to say especially a very warm hello to all of the librarians who are joining us today. I've seen so many just fly by in the chat. And it is so good to see you all here. Uh, and I hope we're going to have a really fun day. Awesome. And I am Caroline Nickerson. I'm with the SciStarter team, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate Earth Day and Citizen Science Month, which runs all through April, than doing some awesome citizen science with Meredith and Megan. Cool, cool beans. Um, so really, that's who you are. And I think, Caroline, can you put the poll open? I know everyone's introducing themselves at the moment, and it's really stunning to see where everyone's from. But it'd be really great to get a feel for how many of you have been involved in citizen science before, what you do, what your interest really in citizen science is. Um, and I think this will just take a, a couple of seconds. Let us know who you are too, um, so that we can make sure you know that you get the most out of this presentation. It's really for you to answer your questions. Um, and again, we'll be moderating the chat, so please feel free to drop any questions that you might have um, in the chats for us to, to answer as we go along. Oh my gosh, we're at 60% are part of a library staff. Um, <laughs> Librarians. <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> um, last chance to vote, everybody. I'm going to close down this first poll question in three, two, one. Okay. So yeah, 60% library, and let me share my results. 60% librarians are library staff. We got a lot of aspiring citizen scientists. Some people are just bored on the internet. That's fine too. Um, that's really great. I'm gonna launch the other poll question really quickly, which is, have you participated in a citizen science project before? So just really quickly, if you all could answer that, we'd love to know. Oh my gosh, a majority have not. Oh, excellent. Fresh meat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last chance to vote. Three, two, one. Last chance for real. I'm about to close the polling. And four. Oh, that's excellent. That's perfect. Um, okay, wow. this is amazing because this is hopefully going to be a really great introduction for you how to dip your toes in to citizen science. Um, but also we should hopefully have a lot of stuff too for the people who are maybe more familiar um, with all of the different forms of citizen science 
that that we have. Um, so before I dive in too deeply, I just wanted to give a quick outline, just let you know um, what to expect in this webinar. I'm going to talk for a little bit about the sort of who, what, when, where, why, and how of citizen science. It's something that I'm heavily involved in. I really love. Um, Carolyn will then give us some more information about how to engage in citizen science, especially April is citizen science month. So there's a ton going on. And then we're going to spend the majority of this just doing some citizen science together. So we're going to be doing some online citizen science or online citizen science. We're going to walk you through um, how to do it. And then we're all going to be online, Megan and Caroline and I monitoring the chat, doing this with you, answering questions, talking about um, citizen science from the citizen scientist point of view, the researchers point of view, uh, talking about how you can fold this into your re own research, your teaching, um, what you do as a librarian. <laughs> There's many librarians out there. Um, I think at the end, it'd be really cool to come back and we're gonna be doing some camera trapping projects, which are super cool and visually engaging. And I'd love to sort of share some of the cool things that we find um, today as we're looking through some of this great data. And then at the end, um, if there's anyone who wants to hang around for a little bit after the webinar and chat with us, again, I'm an ecologist who uses citizen science in my research. Megan is a librarian who's all about open data and citizen science. Um, Caroline, like we all do a lot of education using citizen science as an educational tool. Um, so feel free if you're interested in any of those topics to sort of hang around afterwards and ask us a bunch of questions because we'd love to um, we'd love to help you use this more um, because it helps us. And then sort of how to talk with us. We want this webinar to be something that you get a lot out of. So please be communicating with us. We do ask that you keep your screens off and audio is muted. Audio is muted. Um, but you guys have all found the chat box, which is super. Please drop some questions in there anytime you have them. At the bottom of your screen, I believe there's a Q&A box as well. So if you have a really pressing question, um, shoot it to the moderators there. Feel free to chat with each other um, in the chat as well. If anyone here has done citizen science before and can maybe help people out um, or share their experiences, that would be really great. Um, do we have a raise hands option, Caroline? We do indeed. And it looks oh, like one person is raising their hand, but I think it may have just been, a, I do this all the time, an accidental click. Whoops. Well, if you do it on purpose, we're, we're, uh, we're here to answer those as well. That's right. Um, and then if you want to share this session, come back to this session, uh, make your friends watch this session. It'll be available on YouTube, like Carolyn said, after, um, after we're done. Oh, and then another thing is keep interacting with us, uh, or me at least. Um, I do a lot of citizen science. There's a lot of ways that you can communicate with me and other scientists on the discussion boards on different citizen science platforms, but you can also reach out to us on other social media platforms as well. Um, so we answered that question. So it seems like there's some of you who haven't been involved in citizen science before, so this might be a little bit new. Um, and what citizen science is in a nutshell is really a way for you, curious, passionate people um, from any background to be a researcher and to make real and meaningful contributions to ongoing science, uh, history, medicine, astronomy, conservation. There's whole different realms of citizen science out there. You can find things that you're passionate about to engage in. And so we have citizen science is really a collaboration between researchers and members of the general public where volunteers can help either with data collection uh, or processing or analysis. And by involving volunteers, this really enables research that wouldn't be possible or practical to accomplish in other ways. Like we're doing research that's only possible because people are coming together to assist scientists. And I think the thing that's, I don't know, fantastic for me, I did a lot of citizen science before I became a professional scientist, 
um, is that you're doing real research. You know, you're helping answer actual questions. You're making data sets that are useful for the wider research community. Uh, there's even, you know, there's even a chance that you could make your own discovery in this data set. You know, it's happened before that you could discover something completely serendipitous. And again, um, anyone can be a citizen scientist. You don't need any specialized background or training or expertise in order to participate in science, uh, which is something that, you know, blew my mind when I was first in the world of citizen science. Like anyone can participate. All citizen scientists are, are just curious people, kids, students, adults, anyone who wants to collaborate to help advance research on topics that they, that they care about. Um, so if we, I love this too, if you actually think about the use of like citizens in research and science, you know, like citizen scientists really were um, like the OG, like the original researcher, you know, back in the 1700s, the 1800s earlier, um, being a scientist wasn't a profession you got paid to do. You know, scientists, especially like very famous people that we think of as, you know, the quintessential scientists, were just really curious individuals interested in trying to understand the natural world. And there have been some citizen science projects, some large scale projects that have started hundreds of years ago um, that are still going to this day, which I think is really neat. Um, so the National Weather Service, for example, has had volunteers collecting data back starting in the 1800s. I think this is quite neat. This, what I'm sharing on my screen now, is a page from Thomas Jefferson's diary, um, where he recorded meteorological data that forms part of this continuous record. Um, so our US presidents were participating in science. Um, bird surveys, like people are nuts about birds. If anyone's heard about citizen science before, it's probably through something um, like the Christmas bird count. So amateurs helping with bird monitoring. I think the earliest record of this is in Finland in the 1700s. Um, but in the 1900s, the, our American uh, Museum of Natural History starts the Christmas bird count. Um, and this has happened every single year since the 1900s. And these monitoring programs, their programs, they're still going strong today. And they've really significantly enhanced our understanding of not just bird dynamics, but really our changing world in ways and on scales that, that really just wouldn't be possible without all of this collective help. Um, and I mentioned before that there's two different ways that people really can get involved in citizen science. Um, one of them is to like get out there, get dirty and go collect data. And Carolyn can maybe speak to this. I don't think all projects would involve sample collecting involve quite this amount of mud. Um, I know there's a lot of really wonderful opportunities to go out and collect data that are shared with SciStarter. So you can go to SciStarter.org and find a, a research project near you and researchers can, claim, uh, can train you how to collect all of the samples that they need. And then we have the kind of um, citizen science that we'll be talking about today, online citizen science. And this is typically where volunteers are helping to process data that's already been collected. Um, now I am completely and totally biased, <laughs> but this has to be the best kind of citizen science in my opinion. You know, it's the kind you can do on your couch, in your PJs, you can do it while the ads are playing on your YouTube video. Like you don't need anything but a computer or a smartphone and just a little bit of time. Um, and so this is the citizen scientists that, or this kind of citizen science that we're, we're gonna participate in right now. Um, oops. And then I just wanted to touch on, on the importance of citizen science from my point of view. Um, I'm someone who does citizen science, but I'm also a, a researcher, I'm a professional biologist, and I rely so fundamentally on citizen scientists. Um, I couldn't do what I do without them. But I think what some people don't realize is, is why, like why do researchers need all of this help? Um, and I'm, I'm gonna quickly note that I'm a scientist, so I'm gonna be saying the word science, but this really applies to all different kinds of fields of research, um, as you'll see when we go on to some of our citizen science platforms. Um, 
But really, in the, in the past, especially, scientists didn't necessarily have the capacity to collect large samples of data. You know, we were really just chipping away at our research questions one data point at a time. Um, but now, <laughs> now we have all of these amazing technological advances. Uh, we have satellites, we have space telescopes, we have drones, we have sensors, we have biologers, we have camera traps, we have all of these devices that are continuously collecting massive amounts of data, um, which is a blessing and a curse. You know, in this day and age, we have, we have more data than ever before collected across bigger swaths of space and time than ever before in more ways than ever before. Um, but the problem is, is that many of these data come to us in a form that we can't directly use. So in our research, in my research, we crunch numbers to understand patterns. And a satellite image, um, or in my research, images taken by remote camera traps, um, they need to be translated from picture to data. And now there are, there are some things that artificial intelligence can help us with, um, and we rely on that more and more. But really for many tasks, there's just no substitute to the processing power of the human brain. Um, but we researchers by ourselves, we, we just simply can't process this data fast enough. We have this flood of information coming at us, um, but the, again, the bottleneck, is, the bottleneck is unlocking that data within. Um, so in my work, I do camera trapping. I have thousands of camera traps monitoring wildlife all across Africa. Um, and these are remote cameras we set up in the field. I wish I, I, wish I had one to share with you. I had one uh, just the other day for another talk. Um, but little cameras, we set them up in the field um, and they're triggered to take a picture of any animal that passes in front of them. And they run continuously. They run 24 seven. We leave them in the field for months on end. And we get back something, something like 3 million images a year. And so if you think about it, you know, if it takes me, the researcher, 20 seconds to look at an image and write down what animals are in the image and how many of them there are and what they're doing. And I do this for 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year to go through those 3 million photos. It's going to take me eight years to process one years of data. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, eight more years of data have been gathered. So keeping up with all this data is a completely impossible task, um, but not, not impossible with your help, with the help of online volunteers. So by crowdsourcing these tasks, we're sharing the load. Um, it's helping us to analyze our information more quickly and accurately than would otherwise be possible. It's saving us time and resources and leading to, to faster progress and better understanding of our natural world. Um, so that's, that's what I get out of citizen science. It helps us do the research and conservation on time spans that, that make a difference. Um, but what's in it for you? Obviously you guys are interested in citizen science, you're here. Um, but how do I sell you on the idea of, you know, spending half an hour on our platform instead of like, I don't know, watching an episode of The Office for like the 500th time. Um, and I guess one thing that I really hope, like as a researcher that you love about this is that, again, you get to become a researcher. You're doing science. Uh, you're doing real science. You're making a genuine contribution, you're an indispensable part of the scientific process. Um, like there's research and conservation that's just not possible without you doing this. Um, so hopefully this is, this is providing an opportunity for you to release your inner Indiana Jones or Jane Goodall. And I say this not because your effort is helping or not just because your effort is helping us researchers make new findings. Um, but also because you're the first ones getting a peek at this data and like not to incentivize it too much, but there have been bunches of new discoveries made directly by citizen scientists themselves. Um, so we'll be going onto the Zooniverse, which is a citizen science platform. On that platform alone, I think something like almost 30 new exoplanets have been discovered by citizen scientists in the physics projects, like two new kinds of galaxies. Uh, alien megastars, 
in my camera trapping projects, this is my favorite example of all time. Um, we published a paper a couple of years ago that got like featured in National Geographic uh, where citizen scientists found these little birds um, spending the night sleeping in giraffe armpits. And we, no one had ever seen that before uh, until our citizen scientists brought that to our attention. Um, so you're out there doing research, discovering new things, making a difference. And it's also the perfect opportunity to learn a little bit more about science. Um, there's plenty of facts that we researchers love to share with you that you can impress your friends with. Uh, we're here to answer any questions that pop up when you're observing all of this animal behavior. Um, the projects that are online, they put out tons of in-depth background information about their work. Uh, many also provide resources for educators um, to use these experiences as a teaching tool. And also like as being part of this, you're getting this unique insider's view into what the scientific process is all about. You know, why scientists do what they do. And so hopefully this helps you to better understand and consume the science that you see in the media and the science that you encounter in your everyday lives. <laughs> Especially important in this day and age. Uh, and then the fun part for me is that it's a way for you to meet us. You know, there's still this prevalent public perception that scientists are these crazy old white men in lab coats, uh, but they're not. You know, I'm a scientist. Our panelists are scientists. Uh, researchers are this incredibly diverse group of people from all sorts of backgrounds, which is important because it means that anyone can become a scientist. And we're trying to break down, actively break down those barriers and stereotypes by engaging with our volunteers and hopefully, you know, inspiring the next generation of, of scientific researchers. So I hope those are some of the things that you get out of participating today. Um, Caroline, did you want to share a little bit more about all of the citizen science that's going on this month? Yeah, I'd be delighted. I'm so excited. Let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Right. And, uh, Bear with me, everyone. I have two computers open so I can better monitor your chats. So you're gonna see the side of my face slightly. So we're gonna get up our citizen science month slides. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank Meredith for that wonderful and really educational presentation. Um, we really um, snapshot, the snapshot projects, the camera tra trapping projects are some of my favorites. And um, I know all of you who are tuning in, you all come from really diverse backgrounds. I know we have some Verizon citizen scientists. We have some educators on the line, people from library staffs, um, uh, just people who are bored on the internet. I think all of you are able to get something out of citizen science and um, able to find projects that work for you. Um, so right now, today is Earth Day and we're in the middle of Citizen Science Month, which is April, 2020. And we already did our polls. Um, so you may be wondering, why is this online? And because it was originally going to be in person, I was going to go um, visit Megan and Meredith over in New Jersey, and we were going to do an in person event. Um, but because of public health concerns, all of Citizen Science Month moved online. Um, so if you go to citizenscienceMonth.org, that redirects you to a page on SciStarter, you're able to find a bunch of online events just like this one um, with amazing organizers like Megan and Meredith um, who are making these opportunities available for you to tune in from home and still connect with each other and be part of something bigger than yourself. Um, so we reviewed a little bit about what citizen science is. You know, it's a collaboration between scientists like Meredith and people who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference, like me um, and the rest of you. Um, these are some of our partners for Citizen Science Month. Um, they have all produced really great materials um, that I hope you all can review. Science Friday, they um, are featuring a different citizen science project every week for Citizen Science Month. Um, Nat Geo has a webinar next week um, about education in citizen science. The uh, National Library of Medicine, they've been awesome partners. Um, and they have these featured projects for Citizen Science Month that um, you can do from home to address human and environmental health. So we're so grateful for all of our partners and all the people who are celebrating citizen science this month. Um, if um, during this presentation you feel so inspired, we'd love if you could tweet or um, post on Instagram or post on Facebook with the hashtag SitSciMonth, and we'd love to share it. 
I think the main thing about Citizen Science Month is to spread the word and um, get other people to catch the citizen science bug. Um, so if you use that hashtag, that's a really great, great way of elevating this field and allowing other people to discover awesome projects like the camera trapping project you just saw. So I'm going to skip this video for time. Um, but before I delve into the details on this slide, I just want to emphasize that citizen science is so diverse. It's everything from astronomy to zoology and everything in between. Um, so you could start, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Um, as long as you follow the instructions, you can do real science and you don't have to be a specialist in any of these fields. So you could do um, one of the snapshot projects that, um, you know, that Meredith runs, and then you could do um, a light pollution project um, called Globe at Night. And then after that, you could um, finish up a project called Stall Catchers and help accelerate the search for a cure to Alzheimer's disease. So um, there are so many awesome projects listed on SciStarter and on Zooniverse. Um, and we hope that you delve into those. So I hope if, if you didn't have a chance before this presentation, totally okay. But we hope that if possible, you make a SciStarter account and you also make a Zooniverse account. So you can make a SciStarter account by going to um, SciStarter.org forward slash login. So I just dropped that link in the chat and feel free to grab it from there. And then um, you can make a Zooniverse account just by going to, um, is it Zooniverse.org, Meredith? It is. Zooniverse. And I'll... I can show some of that too. Awesome, yeah. I'll I'll turn it back over. I'll turn it back over to Meredith to show how to log in after um, these slides. Um, but once you have both of these accounts, one cool thing you can do is you can add your Zooniverse username to your SciStarter info and settings. And basically, what that means is that for certain Zooniverse projects that have opted in to being added to SciStarter, you can track the number and frequency of your contributions in your SciStarter dashboard. So I get that all of this is confusing, basically, because uh, there's the world of citizen science is so vast. But to make it a little bit smaller, um, you can just go to SciStarter.org, you make your account, you search for some projects, you do them, you enjoy them. Um, you can go to Zooniverse, um, make an account there. If a project on Zooniverse is also listed on SciStarter, you can add your Zooniverse username to your SciStarter dashboard. And you can track your contributions in both places. And like the beauty of this is no matter how you slice it, you're doing real citizen science. Um, so on SciStarter, you have the project finder where you can search. Um, some of you may be, for example, abruptly homeschooling someone that you didn't think you were going to be homeschooling earlier. You can search for projects that have classroom materials attached to them. Or let's say that you, um, your parents are staying with you, um, you know, during the public health crisis um, and you, you're taking care of them. If you want to bond with them and a project has classified itself as being particularly good for seniors um, or adults, you can search for projects like that. You can search by um, topics like astronomy. You can search for projects that are completely online if you don't want to leave the house, um, similar to the, the camera trapping projects we were talking about in this presentation. Those are completely online. You can go on Safari from your couch, which is just awesome. Um, so the world of citizen science is really vast, but to get you started, we recommend starting with the projects that we're recommending today and then exploring from there with all the awesome resources we have for Citizen Science Month. Um, so this is my SciStarter dashboard. I just wanted to show that. Um, I've joined lots of projects um, and I've been able to track my contributions to different affiliate projects, including some Zooniverse projects. So cool stuff. And this is the Citizen Science Month website. When you go to citizenscienceMonth.org, if you wanted to do an online event every day, you could, and you would find them all here. And like I said, there's something going on every day in April. So we hope that you tune in online and you um, keep on connecting with us and um, continuing to do great work. So please um, use the hashtag, tag us, um, I know I've been trapped in my apartment by myself in self-quarantine, um, so I, it makes my day when people are doing this work and tagging it, so I think it's just a great way to keep on connecting and keep on doing great work. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to Meredith. Cool. All right. Um, I'll share my screen now. I think what would be great for the rest of the um, the rest of the time we have together, maybe the next half hour or so, I'm going to introduce you to some of my favorite citizen science projects, um, tell you a little bit more about them, show you how they work, and then if we could kind of work on projects together as a community, again, with all of us here to answer the questions that you raise in the chat, to see some of the cool things that you discover, 
Um, and then afterwards to, to answer any specific questions you have about education or, or using citizen science for your own research or purposes. Um, so this is the Zooniverse homepage that I'm on now. Hopefully everyone can see it. Um, you can see that I've made very few classifications. That's the one downside of being an, a researcher is I never get to do the fun part. Um, but if you can see up on the top bar in the left, you can go to the projects tab. And I just wanted to show you, Zooniverse is this online platform that brings together a lot of different kinds of virtual citizen science projects. They're in all different kinds of categories. Hopefully you're here for the biology um, because it's the best, but I guess if you could also be interested in history or language or I don't know, physics is okay. Um, but there's lots of different options. There's hundreds of projects on this website for you to explore. And just to kind of keep things manageable, like Carolyn was saying, I'd like to introduce you to some of our projects. So if you guys can come with me to snapshotsafari.org, I think that link, could that link be posted in the chat, please? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so Snapshot Safari is its own little bubble in the Zooniverse. And here in the Zooniverse, um, in, under Snapshot Safari, we've brought together camera trapping projects from all over Africa. So as part of our work, we're interested in studying wildlife communities in different places. We're interested in how these communities are changing. We're interested in protecting these communities, learning about animal species interactions in these communities, but also comparing wildlife dynamics, um, in this case, across an entire continent. So we have several projects here. I think the top row of projects are all from South Africa. Uh, Snapshot Grumetti. Can you guys see my pointer? Is there a way for me to... Um... Yeah, we can see it really well. Okay, you can see it. Okay, so Snapshot Grumetti here on the bottom left is a site in Tanzania that's part of the Serengeti ecosystem, uh, which I think if anyone's seen a David Attenborough documentary or watched The Lion King, like that's Snapshot Grumetti. Um, this one next to it, snapshot APNR, that's a contiguous with the largest wildlife reserve in South Africa. So similar animals, completely different habitat, um, just as beautiful. Ruaha is in Tanzania or Mozambique, I forget. Um, but Wild Cam Gorongosa is one that I'd really like to direct everyone's attention to. I think we're very privileged to have in our chat right now the person who set up Wildcam um, Gorongosa on the ground. So Gorongosa National Park is this absolutely stunning park in Mozambique that unfortunately has gone through a couple decades of civil war and suffered from that war uh, in that all of their, essentially all of their large mammals got wiped out. Their populations got substantially reduced. So in the last few years, there's been tons and tons of really amazing conservation work going on at this site, um, getting the, the large antelope populations back up to what they used to be, reintroducing predators. Um, we've just put some wild dogs in there last year for the first time, which is this, this gorgeous, um, very beautiful African predator. We're starting to see leopards. So that site is super cool as well. And that's the one that I'm going to demonstrate to you how to how to engage and how to use these platforms. So if you click on Wildcam Gorongosa, and again, I hope you guys are doing um, some of this with me, this is the project page. So there's tons of good stuff um, on here to look at. If you're interested in the research and the researchers and what's going on in the reserve where the data was collected and who's collecting it, you can go to the About tab up here on the top. Classify is where we're going to focus on right now. Talk is a discussion board, um, a way for you to communicate with each other, to share your cool findings, to ask researchers questions. Um, and there's lots of different things. Uh, lab is for educators if you want to use citizen science in your, cl in your classroom. Um, so different things you can explore, and I encourage you to do that. But this is the task. This is the citizen science task that we want you um, to help us with. So on the left, you see a camera trap photo. Um, our camera traps, like I said, they're remote cameras. We put them in the field. When wildlife walks in front of them, they're triggered to take a picture. 
Uh, what I didn't mention earlier is that they're actually triggered to take multiple pictures. So what you're presented with here on the left is a sequence of photographs. So again, if you can see my cursor, we're seeing one photo at the bottom middle of the picture. You can flip to see the other photograph in the sequence. Um, down on the bottom left, you can play between those two photographs or even see those two pictures side by side. Um, this is important because sometimes animals move so quickly that you might see them in one photo, but not another. So you might think an image doesn't have anything in it where you go check out the second picture, you might see that there actually is some kind of animal. Um, other fun things we can do, we can invert the colors on the image down on the bottom right. So some images get taken at night and it can be a little bit tricky with the contrast to pick out any animals lurking inside that image. And sometimes flipping the contrast can help with that. Um, and then what I think is really fun and what I hope some of you are able to do today is you can favorite images. Um, this very rightmost bottom or <laughs> button on the bottom lets you add pictures to your private collection. So you can make essentially a photo album. Um, I don't have any collections at the moment, but you can make a collection um, and add photographs to it and then you know, at the end of the day, if you want to see your highlights or your best of, you can go and in the collect tab, revisit your favorite photos. Um, so here we have some kind of creature. Uh, I find that people experiencing African camera trap pho uh, photographs for the first time, you know, you're really good with lions and giraffes and zebras and things we see in zoos, but there's a huge diversity of animals that people might not be so familiar with. Um, so if you happen to know what this animal is, you can directly click on that animal's name in this list of animals that we have. This one's kind of tricky though. So if you don't know what the animal is and you don't want to click through 50 different animals to figure it out, we have some cert, we call them um, filter tools up here. So you can look at these tools and you can decide whether this animal is more like a cat or a dog, or if it happens to look like a primate. I think this animal looks most like some kind of antelope or deer. And so it'll narrow down our selection. We can go and we can look at its pattern. This animal has some very prominent striping. So we can say this is some kind of antelope deer that has stripes. It's narrowing down our selection even further. It's maybe a kind of reddish brown that doesn't really narrow down our selection. Um, you can't see the horns in this picture, but if it did, you could use horn shape to help you filter down your choices. Um, what kind of tail does it have? It's got sort of a bushy, kind of like a bushy tail, I'd say. Um, and maybe kind of a build, a lanky build. So you can use all of these tools. Again, if we were seeing like a baboon or some kind of monkey, we'd select different things to help narrow down our options. Um, and then we're just left with four different kinds of animals. So we can click on the species name of that animal. There's a couple of different pictures of that animal that we can scroll through to see, okay, like do we think that this animal in our camera trap footage could be a bush buck? which is a medium sized antelope with tan to chestnut brown fur. And it sort of looks like this animal. It's got the spots, it's got the stripes. Um, if we weren't 100% sure, a nice feature is that um, we present animals that it could also be animals that look super similar. So bush books are often confused with Nyala. So if we would click on that, um, we'd get some information about this other species. And if you look at these pictures of male and Yala here and the picture of our animal in our camera trap footage, it's a lot darker than this bush book. I think it looks a lot more like an Inyala. So we'll call it an Inyala instead. So after we've decided what animal is in our camera trap um, image, we count the animal. Um, so we say that there's one of them. We're interested in what the animals are doing. That's very helpful for our research. So this one is just sort of standing here, not doing very much. You can select multiple behaviors. So if it was eating, if it was also getting groomed by another animal that was interacting with an animal, you could click those as well. Um, 
We don't see any babies, so we ask people to look and see if there's any infants or juveniles um, in the image. And in this image, you can sort of see the base of some animal's horns. So we would say yes here. And then we identify our animal. So some photos have multiple animals in them. So if this image happened to contain a bird or a hippopotamus or a wild dog, we would go through this process again and select the other species. Um, but in this case, I think we've just got one animal. We figured out what it is, how many of them there are, what it's doing. And so we're done with that classification. If I'd clicked done and talk, it would have taken us to the discussion board and we could have discussed that image. If you had a question about what the animal was doing, um, you could have gone to talk with some researchers about it. And so that's, that's it, it's that simple. Um, I wanna give you guys some time to do some classifying together with us. I'll keep classifying here on the screen and answering questions um, as we go. But one thing I just wanted to stress before I, I let everyone loose is that it's okay to guess. Like I don't expect, um, you know, not a lot of people have spent the last decade studying African wildlife um, like some of us have. Uh, so some of these animals might be a little bit confusing. You might not be able to tell one antelope. Is it really this antelope or is it the other one? Is it a bush buck or an yala? But it's okay to guess. Every single one of these pictures gets looked at by multiple volunteers and we aggregate all of those answers. So we rely on the wisdom of the crowds essentially to come up with the final classification. And if there are some images where people just really have no idea what's in it, none of the volunteers are guessing the same thing, then researchers go and we'll look at those pictures and we'll verify the data. So please guess, like we get a lot more out of you guessing what animal is in an image um, than you skipping the image entirely. Um, so please take your best shot, um, explore some pictures, save some pictures to your collection. I'd love to pull up some collections um, at the end if anyone has any favorite photos that they'd like to share. Otherwise, I'm going to start answering some of the questions in the chat um, and, and classifying on screen. And this is really your time, like do some citizen science, let's do this together, talk with people in the chat. Um, and maybe after the next 20 or 30 minutes, we'll come together. I have some fun photos I'd love to share with you um, and we can answer any more questions. Yeah, and please everyone ask us anything in the chat. It can be about citizen science. It can be what is SciStarter? What is Zooniverse? Um, it can be what, how do libraries fit in with citizen science? Meredith's gonna be classifying things on, on screen and we're just here to talk. So go to snapshotsafari.org and start classifying. Yeah, um, any questions? As well? Oh, what's the best thing you've ever found in a camera trap photo? Um, what is the best thing? So we see all kinds of weird things. Actually, uh, Megan, can I, can I ask you to classify and maybe I'll, I'll answer some of these questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, is that okay? <laughs> I'm gonna tag Megan in for a second. Um, and I'm gonna, where did my chat, sorry, I'm not a Zoom expert, so here's my chat window. Okay, um, the best thing we've ever found in a camera trap photo. Well, I think the thing I really love about camera trap photos is that like the animals don't know the camera traps are there, right? So there's a difference in what we see you studying animals using camera traps than how we would observe animals if I was like sitting there in a tree with a pair of binoculars, right? Uh, animals would, would see me, they'd smell me, they wouldn't behave the way they naturally would. But these cameras, we get this, you know, like this secret peek into their secret lives. And so we've had um, images of, of animals mating. We get that on camera trap. Um, we once had a picture um, from some of our Serengeti data, um, some of our one of our Tanzanian projects of an antelope giving birth, uh, which was uh, quite gross. Um, we've had a picture, one of my favorites is we had a picture, um, a sequence of pictures of a lion's hunting. Um, and we get that quite frequently. So that wasn't the weird part. Um, but in this case, it was lions hunting hyenas. 
Um, and then the final picture of that sequence is a, a lion with a big hyena in its jaws. So there's a lot of like very interesting stuff out there. Um, it's just a matter of clicking through enough of enough pictures of Impala um, to get to those really juicy ones. Um, do you know of any high schools that offer citizen science as an elective course? I do. Can, can you, is that yeah. you, Karen? Yeah, yeah, tell me. <laughs> Lots of schools do it. It's becoming really, really popular. Um, more commonly, rather than it's being its like whole big course, schools will integrate it in existing science classes. So I'm dropping in the chat our link to scistarter.org forward slash education. Um, those are projects that we picked out and um, sorted by grade level. And they're, they're all SciStarter affiliates, so you can track your contribution dashboard to them, which is helpful for teachers because they can have students print out their dashboards. If you're over the age of 13, you can have a SciStarter account. Um, and most of those projects also have classroom materials. So yeah, citizen science is a great thing to put in the classroom. I actually, right before this, I presented to um, 50 second graders about how to track pollinators with citizen science. And of course, their parent or guardian has to enter the data for them because they're too young. But they just loved it because I was able to be candid with them and say, look, I was scared of science as a kid. Like I have a lot of test anxiety. I didn't like it. But then I discovered citizen science and I absolutely fell in love with it because I knew, you know, you don't have to be the world's greatest expert to make a meaningful contribution. You just have to follow the instructions and have fun. Um, so yeah. And I'm dropping in the chat as well. Um, the Zooniverse itself offers a lot of camera trap specific citizen science educational material. Um, one of these links is for activities we've built for middle schoolers. One of them is for high schoolers. One of them is for undergraduate level um, students in college. So if you are a teacher, there's videos, there's online interactive multimedia, we have activities. We have curricula, we have lesson plans. Um, so there is a lot, if you explore, the Zooniverse itself has a classroom area. Um, and while Cam Gorongosa is one of those sites that has an associated classroom that uh, Caitlin, the researcher who set that up, um, partnered with Bio Interactive, an organization with Howard Hughes Medical Institute to make some like really top notch educational material. So there is a ton of stuff out there. Um, and if my links get lost in the chat, feel free to give me a ping later on social media and I can send those out your way again. Uh, and though we have a camera trap question. Um, someone asked, what is the easiest way to find camera trap projects in our local areas? Probably SciStarter. Um, so there are like camera trapping, um, I guess my question for you, person who asked the question, would be if you're talking about which part of the citizen science process you're talking about, whether it's setting up cameras and collecting data for scientists, or if you're interested in essentially like classifying the data that would be collected in your own backyard, so to speak. Um, so there's, I think, eMammal, oh, let me put that in That's the a chat. Great one. Emammal is an organization with the Smithsonian. I think they have a system where if you own a camera trap and you want to put it up in your backyard and collect data for them, they have a set of protocols you can follow to contribute to their database. Uh, but if you're interested, you know, like African animals, I think are super cool. Um, but you know, if you're someone in, in North America or Europe, um, there's amazing wildlife in your own backyard. You know, there are citizen science projects, there are camera trapping projects looking at, I think there was one Chicago Wildlife Watch. There was a citizen science camera trapping project set up in Chicago to monitor all of the wildlife in Chicago. And there's a surprising amount of it. Um, so I think, I don't know if she's still in the chat, um, but we have a researcher here, Caitlin Potter, who set up a camera trap citizen science program in Minnesota called Eyes on the Wild. Um, I'm gonna drop that link in the chat too. Oh, she already has. That's an amazing program. Um, they're camera trapping in Minnesota and they have everything from rabbits and, and chipmunks to bears and wolves in their camera trapping project. 
And there's, it seems to me from interacting with that project and helping with that project, there's so much to learn about animals that I thought I already knew. Um, there's, it's surprisingly, like you think you look out your window every day and see a squirrel, but you get, I don't know, you get so, I got a lot out of, so much out of Eyes on the Wild. And that's another great uh, project that you could use in a classroom setting to teach, you know, students about wildlife that they encounter in their everyday lives. Um, Someone asked, um, how do you get funding slash permission for the camera traps to be placed in the Serengeti? Uh, <laughs> um, so it's a process. Uh, doing research in in Africa is um, you have to make sure that it's okayed by the government, it's okayed by the wildlife agencies. Um, I think the nice thing about camera trapping is that it's not manipulative. It's a very passive way for us to observe a system. And so we go through the Tanzanian authorities um, that monitor research. We go through the Serengeti National Park authorities um, who make sure that all of the data collected in their park is collected ethically and doesn't disturb the wildlife. And um, there's many different boxes we have to check there. And then in terms of funding, we've been very fortunate to get funding from places like National Geographic and from the National Science Foundation. We get a lot of sponsorship at the moment. Um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute is another one that sponsored a lot of our work. Um, we get a lot of sponsorship from zoos at the moment, which is really fun. Uh, so if you go on that wider snapshot, uh, Sorry, if you go on the Snapshot Safari platform, you can see that we're camera trapping in a lot of different sites. And some of those sites are sponsored by specific zoos. So um, that zoo, you know, is, um, how do I want to say this? Like sponsors that site. If you go to that zoo, you have a connection with that specific area, which is super cool. Um, so the permission and funding comes in from a lot of different places. And Megan, can I bother you for a second? I see in the Q&A we have a question about how libraries fit in with citizen science. Yeah, um, so I'm a science librarian and um, I think it's different how I interact with um, citizen science than you might if you were in a public library. Um, so public libraries are doing things like having um, kits for patrons to check out and take home that have things like rain gauges and magnifying glasses, um, uh, things to do, uh, help, help collect field data. Um, I come at it from a different side, which is um, from the, the perspective of a science librarian working in an academic library. Um, so for me, uh, a science librarian has very little to do with books. I hate to disappoint. I love books, but it's really a very, very small portion of what I actually do. Most of the time, what I'm doing is I'm working with uh, researchers uh, to manage all of the research information that they are producing throughout the entire research life cycle. So everything from having an idea and formulating a hypothesis to um, collecting data, analyzing data, and then eventually publishing their results. As they go through that process, they are generating things like research data, research code, they're um, producing preprints and they're doing registrations and they are producing articles. Um, all of this research information that they're, pr they're producing, we want to have um, best open science practices available and in place uh, to help them um, to make, make it easier for them to open up the research process um, to, the, to the public and to um, people who are supporting this research through um, their tax dollars and to be able to make it um, easier to share research information among scientists. Um, so I come at citizen science through uh, open science. Um, I work with researchers to help, help them open up their workflows open up their research data, open up their research code, um, uh, the products of their research, if it's an article, if it's a data set. Um, I work with them to make all of those things open and freely available and discoverable. Um, and part of that is citizen science. Um, so Meredith and I are kind of ramping up our work at Princeton where we're hoping that researchers will um, take us up on this offer to start using these kind of citizen science methods to 
collect data on these big projects that have giant data sets and need um, more eyes and hands and human brains um, working on them. So that's that's kind of the two different perspectives. So from the public library perspective of um, encouraging um, participation uh, in the general public and then from the academic library perspective, which is um, working more with researchers. Um, all right, so I think we're getting pretty close to time. Do we want to switch over to Meredith to show us some of her favorite pictures? Sure. Um, can I answer one qu last question? Let's do it. Um, and then uh, Maria has asked a question about the time and effort that it takes to set up a project like Snapshot Serengeti. Actually, maybe I'll maybe I'll share some photos first so that all of the participants um, who have been have been helping with citizen science can see some of the fun shots. Um, and then I'll, Maria, if you can hang out for a little bit afterwards, I can talk about the the process um, and what kind of skills you need to set up these kinds of projects. And it's it's not very difficult. Um, Megan, can I please share my screen? Uh, all right, let me, sorry guys, I'm a total noob at Zoom, here we go. Um, <laughs> try this one more time. All right, so I just put together uh, <laughs> a couple of my favorite photos just to incentivize people um, to keep plugging away. Uh, a lot of these photos, we sometimes, some of you may have noticed that you're going through a lot of pictures that might not have anything in them. Uh, so sometimes we get like waving vegetation will set off the trigger that makes the camera take a picture. But if you keep going, um, you can find some really cool things. So we get some, this is probably my favorite picture from all of Snapshot Serengeti is, uh, whoops, this hippopotamus right here. I think Megan was online this morning and found some really gorgeous zebra. Um, Megan, Caroline, and I have put together a collection. Caroline, where was this taken? Um, oh, I forget which project it was, but I was doing some of it this morning too, just to get my brain going. I just I thought this was so pretty. I love the selfies where the animals come and actually stick their faces right up in the cameras. This one is so from Gorongosa, the project that hopefully some of you have dabbled in right now. Um, these are water buck. There's millions of them in Gorongosa. They look like reindeer. They look like they shouldn't be in such a tropical, sandy system. Um, but they live there right next to lions and, and zebras. And they're actually, I think, very beautiful. Um, these are some of my favorite from Tanzania. Uh, you can get, we get a fair number of cheetah, again, if you keep plugging through um, the images. Can, any, does any, can anyone guess what this is? <laughs> is that a uh, hyena? This is a hyena. Uh, I think it looks like something that comes out of Pixar. Um, again, sometimes, especially hyenas are very, very curious. So they'll come right up to the cameras. They'll give them a big sniff. Um, sometimes they give them a quick chomp. We've lost a fair number of, of cameras to hyenas. Uh, but hyenas, you know, for all the bad rap they get, they're actually super beautiful um, and funny animals if you look at them. Uh, another thing to look out for in our camera traps is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes uh, the colors go a little funny and then you can get these weird psychedelic photos um, like these gorgeous sunset zebras. So yeah, so again, if anyone has any photos in their collections and would like to post a link to their collections to the chat, um, that would be fun to see what people have spotted. Um, otherwise, I'll hang out and keep answering some questions. Thank you everyone who's taken this time today to learn a little bit about citizen science and to help us do citizen science. Um, every classification, you know, helps. It makes a difference. It's, we need to turn this data around so quickly in some cases, especially with these sites that you guys participated in today. We're trying to use this data for not just research, but also conservation. And things happen so quickly and the sooner we can unlock this data, um, you're really making a huge difference. Uh, so thank you again. And I'm gonna go back to Maria's question. Where did you go? Um, um, 
Yeah, she wanted to know how much time and effort does it take to set up a project like Snapshot? We have a lot of unclassified camera trap photos from various projects and groups. Yeah, so I'm gonna, let me actually share my screen again and I'll sort of show you the behind the scenes of what it looks like to have a Zooniverse project. Um, and again, I don't know if Caitlin or Caitlin <laughs> uh, from Wild Cam Gorongosa and Eyes on the Wild are still in the chat, um, but they also have experience setting up Zooniverse projects and might have some things to say um, that I might miss. So let me share my screen again. Um, all right. So can you guys see my Zooniverse page? So yep. um, on Zooniverse, it is free for people to build their own citizen science projects, um, which is really wonderful and amazing. Um, it's a great resource offered by the Zooniverse. And they've done everything they can to make it as easy as possible. Um, so if I go into Wildcam Fort Gorgosa, for example, so it's a lot of drag and drop. It's a lot of fill in the blank. You don't need a ton of coding skills, any coding skills. Um, there is some um, data wrangling that has to go on in terms of exporting all of the citizen science um, classifications. But really setting up the project, we fill in details like what our project is about. If any of you guys checked out the about tabs, this is what it looks like behind the scenes. It's a little bit of markup language. Um, and another thing about running a citizen science project, which I think is very important in terms of using it to turn over data, is people seem to love to help. And we, I appreciate that so much, all of the citizen scientists who dedicate their time and their energy and their effort to doing this. Um, but people become more engaged the more you engage with them. So the more information you put about your research and your team and, and what you're doing with those results, the more you interact on those discussion boards, the more researchers or the more volunteers you're going to attract and retain for your project. So again, behind the scenes, you can have multiple people collaborate on your projects. Anyone with a Zooniverse account, you can fill in. Again, this is mostly extra information. Um, data goes up in workflows. So you'll batch upload your camera trap photos. Um, and then those will get classified by citizen scientists. And then you can export that data at the end of the day. Uh, Zooniverse, if you can see on this bottom left, has a ton of really great tutorials. The Zooniverse people are always on chats, ready to help. There's so many fun things you can do um, with these platforms. Like we're currently working to translate some of our projects into local languages. Um, so there's an option to set it up um, to do translations uh, and make your project available in all different kinds of languages. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility. I come from an ecologist background. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a computer geek. I wish I was. And it's very easy to figure out. And a lot of the time and effort goes into just formatting the data for upload, um, talking with your volunteers, and then figuring out how to consolidate all of those guesses um, that the volunteers give you at the end of the day. Um, so I think if you have I don't know how, what, how many camera trap photos you have. Um, we are working with I don't know, tens of thousands of photos and it works really well for us um, per project. Are there, um, Carolyn, can you field me some more questions? Yeah, one person asked, um, and I'm paraphrasing it, um, what do you do when you only see part of an animal um, and it's hard to identify? Best like a guesses. corner of animal fur in a picture. Um, yeah, no, and I can't emphasize this enough, like, even you guessing lets us know that that picture at least contains an animal. Um, and again, like the filter tools are a really good way if you can only see a really fuzzy butt, but you get you can figure out what the tail looks like and what color it is that helps narrow it down. Um, again, don't forget to flick through all of the photos in that sequence. Um, 
because you might, you know, maybe you can only see part of an animal in one photo, but the rest of the animals in the other photo. And again, you know, guesses count. If we see us researchers looking at all those guesses at the end of the day that there isn't a lot of consensus as to what people thought it was, we'll go and take a look at the picture, but it just helps to know that there's something in there and any information that you can give us from guessing uh, is important. So I know it's super hard sometimes and there's pictures, especially like at night where it's just eyes um, or you're just getting like a tail or a horn where it can be very tricky. Um, and to be honest, sometimes it, it gets easier with time. Like the more you familiarize yourself, the more photos you go through, the more you get to know all of the different animals that exist within that project that you're working on. Sometimes that does get a little bit easier. So hopefully that helps. Um, is there anything, what else have we got? We have another question. Someone asked, after going through and clicking on task descriptions, no identify tab comes up. If I wanna skip this image, how do I get to the next picture? Oh, we don't make it easy to skip the image because we want you to guess. <laughs> don't skip the pictures. Uh, please don't skip the pictures, I should say, because we value what you do and all your help. Um, make a guess please make a guess and then you'll get to the next image. We, when we were first setting up these citizen science projects and figuring out how to best use your time in a meaningful way, one thing that we did in the very beginning was have a button for I don't know. Um, and we found that people, like we lost so much information, so much valuable information by having people not guess that now we kind of make it very difficult for you not to guess because again, anything you can give us helps. <laughs> um, one question, I'm interested to hear both of your thoughts on it. Someone asked about service time in citizen science projects. Like I know for some of our affiliate projects at SciStarter, we do kind of like back of the envelope calculations estimate service time. So like stall catchers told us it usually takes two minutes to complete an observation. So we, and since we're able to track the number and frequency of observations for affiliates, if we see that someone made a hundred classifications on stall catchers, we multiply that by two minutes and that's how we give them their service time credit. But what do you both think about volunteer hours in citizen science? Do you think it's possible to track or would it be a good fit for the snapshot projects? Um, yeah, so I don't think, to my knowledge, we haven't had people classify on our camera trap projects for service hours. Maybe Caitlin or Caitlin um, can speak to this for their projects. Um, but it is very easy to track how many classifications you do either through the Zooniverse or through SciStarter if you link your account. And I would be happy as a project manager to provide, make some documentation for students working with these projects testifying to how many classifications that they've made. Um, not something I've done before, but something that, you know, if it got more people to engage in our projects, we could definitely look into. So if whoever asked that question wants to shoot me an email, we can chat about that a bit further. I guess I haven't provided my email. I'm going to put my, should I put my email in here? Please no one Zoom bomb me. Um, <laughs> I guess you can, I guess you can find it on our citizen science websites. But um, yeah, please feel free to get in touch if you want more information um, about folding these projects into your research, your work, your education. I'm happy to send out those links to all of the, um, all of the different educational resources that we posted again, and some of the other good stuff that's come up in the chat. There's some really great blog posts that have been linked in the chat. Um, oh, someone's linked us to their collection, um, which is worth checking out. Uh, yeah, so no, please feel free to get in touch if I haven't answered your question entirely, um, or you want to follow up with me on something like service hours, and we can we can have a chat and make a plan. And then Faith asked, I would like to make the identification, but there's no ID tag that I can click on. Oh, um, You'd like to make, so are you going straight from the main screen with all of the choices of animals? Are you, maybe we could, um, Megan, are you the one classifying at the moment? 
Yeah, I am. So I wonder if um, there's kind of a, a two two steps. So you identify, so you click the identify here, and then you have to click done for it to actually record it. Um, so you're saying that this identify button is not present um, because that would be a very odd error. And then Faith, if you don't mind, oh. I can promote you to panelists so you can share your screen and show us the issue you're having. And um, oh, Caitlin says, sometimes the identify button is grayed out if you haven't answered all the required questions. Yeah, that's a really good point. So if there's something, if you haven't um, put down how many animals are in there, if you haven't clicked yes or no on whether there's babies or horns, then it won't let you classify. So as soon as you've put all of the information there, um, that data sh or that option should show up. Faith says, thank you, seems to be working now. Okay, perfect. Woo! Um, <laughs> yes. No, there's definitely uh, little, little tricks. Um, and again, we have, so if you go to the about tabs um, right above the image in the classification, we have um, FAQs there. So if you have a question about how to do something specific, Another thing we didn't highlight, but you guys may have run into if you were starting the task for the first time, is that we have a tutorial option. Um, so on the top right of Megan's screen right now, just above those filter tools, if you click tutorial, um, then it will bring up a little how to that steps you through what we did um, today. Oh, yeah, and the field guide tab. Um, so we have the tutorial, we have the about tab, we have um, all of this information about our project and how to use our project. And then something that's quite cool that Zooniverse put in in the last year or so is the field guide. So on the right hand side of your screen, you have this tab which you can pop open and it has extra, extra information. And so this information might be information that the researchers thought might help you better classify the animals. So if there's some animals that look super, super similar and we're not able to put in enough information as part of the classification task, check out the field guide because maybe we have some more pictures, some extra details. Um, some researchers use the field tab to, or the field guide to just share some fun facts about some of the lesser known animals or different animals that you see. Um, so there's a lot to look at in the field guide. If you like A, don't think there's enough information in the regular classifying tool to help you decide what animal that is, check out the field guide. If you wanna learn more, um, just go check out the field guide. And, oh, I'm so glad Caitlin's here. I'm gonna make another one more comment about the classification process and then I'll answer Billy's question about being a researcher. Um, so another thing that Caitlin has brought up, which is really great, is that um, some of these projects, the projects we're working on right now, we're asking you, um, look at this camera trap picture and tell us what animals are in it and what they're doing. Some of the camera trap classifying projects have a different, um, a different task that we ask you to do. And so we have other tasks for these different projects where maybe we ask you simply, is there an animal in this picture or not? Um, and for some camera trap sites where we have lots and lots of pictures where it's just vegetation waving in the wind, or maybe for projects where we're trying to integrate artificial intelligence guesses into our classification, um, which I can talk about more if anyone's interested we might just need you to confirm, like, is there an animal? Does this classification match the computer? And so when you go to the main page of a project, you would have an option to choose whether you want to do animal or not, or identify the species. And the really fun thing about animal or not is that we also have that available on our mobile app as well. Um, so I imagine most of you are accessing this from a computer but if anyone, if anyone has a smartphone, I assume everyone has a smartphone. For everyone who has a smartphone, um, the Zooniverse has an app. If you download the Zooniverse app, you can then find a lot of our camera trapping projects on the app. And then it's sort of just like, it's just like Tinder. You swipe left or right for, is there an animal in the picture or is there not? 
So that's a really fun one for you riding the bus, you know, you're just messing around on your phone, do a couple classifications for us. Um, yeah, excellent point, Nora, like super fun with younger kids. You know, if you have an iPad with your kids, they're just swiping, you know, they don't have to figure out exactly what of seven different antelope species it is, but they get to see some really great pictures, experience a cool new part of the world. And the only question they're asking or answering is, is there something in this picture? Um, so that's a that's another workflow. That's something that you might see if you're trying to access. None of the projects on Snapshot Safari have this workflow online at the moment. Um, but some of the other projects like Eyes on the Wild, they do have an option um, for you to, if identifying animals is, you know, you just don't wanna deal with something quite that complicated. You can still look at a lot of fun camera trap photos and help us do some science just by seeing if there's anything in them. We have a question in the Q&A section. Eric asked, when classifying, what happens when we are wrong or if I think I see an animal and there isn't one? Yeah, so like I said um, before, this is a really great question. I think Caitlin's also there's posted a great link to a blog post about this. Um, but you're essentially, you are not the only person looking at this image. This image will go to 10, 15, 20 other people. And so, oh, that is a really cool photo, by the way. We've got a nice hyena. Um, so if you make a, a, a false positive or a false negative, like if you incorrectly identify an animal or you think there's an animal there and you make an identification when there really isn't, we'll sort of see that signal in the data. Again, we have a lot of different eyes on these photos. People are gonna pick out different things and when we, the researchers at the end of the day, go and look at everyone's classification answers, some photos, which are really easy, like all 10 people agreed it was one hyena, we can say with a lot of certainty that image probably contains one hyena. But if there's one image where you classified that maybe there was an aardvark and someone else classified that there was a pangolin and someone else thought it was a mongoose, um, like we'll see that in the data that helps us flag really difficult photos or maybe, you know, like maybe enough people decided that it was a pangolin. Um, and so we'll go by that consensus to decide what's in the picture. Um, so guesses help. Like if in that second example, if everyone guessed it was some kind of small, low, little mammalian critter, we know it's not an elephant or a hippopotamus or a wildebeest. Um, so guesses are important, but it's okay to guess wrong. It's okay. Like if you make a mistake, if you accidentally classify something and you're like, oh no, what did I do? I already hit done. There's nothing you can do. Don't worry about it. Um, we have tested this, like we've been doing this for years. We've seen the data. We've compared citizen science classifications, the consensus aggregated ones to data that experts have classified. And like, to be honest, if you consolidate all of those citizen science classifications into a consensus answer, um, for the projects we're working on now, I think those consensus answers across the board are something like 97 or 98% accurate compared to researcher classifications. So they match up almost 100% of the time. And again, like, if I spent my days, you know, like 40 hours a week just looking at camera trap photos, my brain would melt and I would not be 97% accurate on anything. Um, so the accuracy of citizen science data, even with the mistakes, is still like amazingly high and perfect for using in real research. Um, I just wanted to answer Billy's question quickly. If Billy, if Billy Joe is still on the, on the chat, um, Billy Joe asked about the education that I have um, so I trained as a biologist. I got, um, a bachelor's in zoology from a small liberal arts school in the U.S. I then, uh, rather than going straight to graduate school, I took a couple years off. I did a bunch of different field projects. So I went out, I worked for different labs. I worked for different organizations, collecting data, um, just sort of experiencing all different kinds of science research because um, I wasn't really 100% sure 
what I wanted to pursue as a career. Um, and after I did that for a couple of years, I, I got a much better idea of the kinds of questions I wanted to ask and the kinds of systems I wanted to work in. And so then I went back to school. I got my PhD um, at the University of Minnesota. So PhD is like five, six years of education. Um, at the University of Minnesota is when I started getting involved in camera trapping. I started getting really heavily involved in citizen science. The University of Minnesota is still doing some really amazing stuff. Um, they're the ones running these camera trapping, online camera trapping organizations. So they're really heavily involved in this. Um, I study predator-prey interactions, so I don't have a background in building websites or running code or consolidating citizen science classifications. This is all stuff that got picked up on the way. Um, and now I'm a postdoc. So I did a, a postdoc studying wolf for colonization in the States. And now um, I'm at Princeton doing a postdoc studying um, predator communities in Africa. And so postdocs are just like a one or two years of research you get paid to do. I still use a lot of camera trap data. It's really the way that I explore these animal communities. Um, again, because we get tons of data, we get data on so many different kinds of animals and so many different kinds of interactions and camera traps let us explore big landscapes. They let us monitor these landscapes for really long time. Um, and so the camera trapping that I started in my PhD, I still use this data um, to this day, essentially, to ask the questions that I'm really interested in. So education was a bachelor's, a PhD, and now I'm doing a couple of postdocs trying to figure out what I want to do next. Um, are there any more questions in the chat that I can speak to? Um, thanks again for everyone who's participated and asked questions and provided resources. That's been super helpful and I hope people have been following along because there's been some really good stuff coming up. And um, um, I'll have a record of the chat. So um, hopefully oh, perfect. when we all have time to breathe a little bit, we can put together a blog post um, with some of the answers to these questions and the highlights from our presentation. And for if you want to share this with your friends and family, the YouTube link is um, going to be up there after, and it's up there right now. So I'll go ahead and post that in the chat again. Um, so feel free to send that around to get people involved. Um, any any final thoughts from either of you? Either of me, oh, or, uh, <laughs> me and <Mary>. Megan. <laughs> Um, again, I'm just so incredibly grateful um, that so many people showed up today to participate. Um, again, hopefully you learned a little bit about citizen science. Hopefully you're inspired to do a little bit more citizen science. Any classifications that you happen to have done while we've been chatting, again, like it, it makes a difference. I can't stress enough that like this is real science making a real difference. Like, we use this data. Um, to ask real questions about the world. And it's just, I'm always so touched that people do choose to help and do choose to, again, you could be watching The Office and instead you're spending this time helping us out, um, which I know is a big sacrifice on people's parts. <laughs> uh, so just thank you everyone. Um, I hope that you've become more interested in this research. Um, spend some time doing research and also again I think the wonderful thing about citizen science is it breaks down barriers between people who aren't scientists and people who are scientists we're just regular people just like you I think that you know like people don't know scientists they don't have a friend who's a scientist they don't know that we're real people they don't know why we do what we do or how we use information um, there's a lot of science in the media now uh, especially about you know uh, COVID and coronavirus. And the more you engage with science, the more like the better you're able to understand how those studies are done and what those graphs mean and how to think about those data, which I think is also really important, especially in the world today. Um, and also check out those universe. There are some health and medicine related citizen science projects. So if, you know, if you want to do something to help, you can help with COVID. Like you can help fight diseases through citizen science. Like go check out, explore some of those projects as well. Um, it's a really great way to like, like not, 
it's a great way to have purpose, you know, I think in this time where a lot of us are struggling with like what to do with ourselves, yeah. um, help us out. Like you are, you are so important to what we do and thank you so much. Yeah. And you don't have to have a STEM degree too, to do science. Like my degree was in East Asian languages and I ended up falling into the citizen science world as a citizen scientist coming to work at SciStarter and then doing science all day. So you can, <laughs> you never know where life will take you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Megan and Meredith. This was so much fun. Um, and I think we'll probably end it here unless Megan, do you have anything else you'd like to say? No, it's going to be really hard to get back to work today <laughs> because <laughs> I want to keep looking for elephant families now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank right. you again. I'll sign off. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you spend a lot of it looking at camera trap photos. <laughs> hey, that's my plan. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>